By way of background, Dirk Jan has extensive experience in financial sector regulation and supervision, both as a senior supervisor at the Dutch Central Bank and then with us at IMF, where he first served for four years as a regional advisor at the IMF Technical Assistance Center covering East Africa, before joining IMF headquarters in 2016. And before joining the Dutch Central Bank, Dirk Jan also had a private sector career working at the ING Bank Netherlands. Tanai, before joining the IMF, worked at the Bank of Thailand as a deputy director in the Payment Systems Policy Department. And he's also worked at Anderson Consulting and the Bank of Finland. And Tanai, who holds a PhD in Information Systems from the London School of Economics, has written on numerous topics related to digital payments, including central bank digital currencies, fintech, and mobile payments oversight. Today, Tanai will start us off by providing us with an overview of the regulatory landscape of, and the, of digital payments. And Dirk Jan will follow by drilling down further on how to identify and manage risks with electronic money. So without further ado, Tanai, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction, Anne Margaret. Good morning, everyone from the spring meetings. I hope you are well where you are, and thank you for joining us. One of the most visible impacts from the digital revolution is payments. The way we pay has gradually changed with the rise of electronic commerce. This has more recently accelerated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Different payment methods are held in our wallets worn on our risk and offered on our mobile devices, or to be trendy, we would say e-wallets. My colleague Dirk Jan and I will show you how INF staff are helping member countries develop safe, efficient, and inclusive digital payment systems. The talk will describe the range of our technical assistance work outline our analytical framework for regulating digital payments, and share a concrete example on the regulation of e-money issuers. Authorities have worked hard to ensure two key public policy objectives are met. That is safety and efficiency. A simple analogy helps. Payment systems are like the plumbing system in our homes. We don't know that they're there until they break down. The pipes are the payment rails, procedures, and rules to transfer funds. Water reflects payment flows. That is payment instruments like credit transfers, cards, debit cards, electronic money. Soon, there could be stable coins and even central bank digital currencies. The IMF has worked with authorities in many jurisdictions to support their efforts in achieving safe and efficient payment systems. This has ranged from countries in Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and the Caribbean, for example. To illustrate recent missions on digital payments and infrastructures have included the following. One, modernizing national payment systems and their oversight framework. This focuses on applying international standards to identify gaps, recommend remedial actions, and ensure the plumbing system is fit for purpose. Such work has benefited countries which have not formally assessed their systemically important payment systems or need an update. On oversight, we work with authorities to strengthen their regulatory, supervisory, and oversight frameworks for payment systems and new payment services. We have recently completed missions for our member countries in Africa and the Caribbean and planning to do similar work for other member countries in Asia. 
two, training authorities on the application of the international standards and the regulation and supervision of new digital payment services. We have delivered training on the principles for financial market infrastructures and FinTech related issues at our training centers in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. Three, strengthening the regulation and supervision of e-money issuers. In response to authorities' requests, we have collaborated with our international experts to help improve authorities' understanding of the European Union's Payment Services Directive 2 and address licensing requirements and harmonization issues. And four, analyzing central bank digital currencies or CBDCs. IMF staff have developed an analytical framework to assist authorities in asking the right questions on CBDCs. Digital payments and the regulation have warranted the attention of many authorities. A further challenge authorities faced is the lack of international standards or guidance for the oversight of new retail payment services. The plumbing system illustrated earlier has in fact evolved into a complex ecosystem as follows. First, there are new technologies, application programming interfaces, big data analytics, biometric technology, cloud computing, contactless technologies, digital identification, distributed ledger technology, and the internet of things. Second, there are new products and services, instant payments, central bank digital currencies, and stable coins. And third, there are new access modes, electronic wallets, open banking, and super apps. IMF staff have helped authorities to address these challenges by developing an analytical framework for regulating digital payments. This has aimed to strengthen their oversight and supervision. It is of relevance for countries whose retail payment oversight frameworks are evolving in response to the changing financial landscape. The analytical framework serves as a decision tree and includes four steps. The first step identifies if an economic activity undertaken by an entity is a payment service. Their identification helps to design effective oversight and supervisory frameworks while avoiding unnecessary overlaps or duplication of regulatory efforts. Explicit payment service laws help provide clarity on the activities. The second step determines if an entity providing the payment service requires licensing or designation as a regulated payment system. Licensing of payment service providers differ across jurisdictions. Threshold values it helps separate licensing and registration requirements. Designation decisions for payment service providers could arise if they have high risk and systemic profiles. Systemically important payment systems are highly regulated given their potential to trigger or transmit systemic disruptions. The risk profiles and regulatory intensity of payment infrastructures could help form designation decisions. New payment infrastructures should therefore be assessed on their risk profiles. The third step identifies any emerging risk that may not be effectively addressed in the current regulatory framework. Risk could fall under five categories, including funds protection, financial integrity, cyber and data security, access to payment systems, and interoperability. The inherent risk of each payment service could differ depending on their nature of activity. The fourth step 
promotes legal certainty through a transparent, comprehensive, and sound legal framework for payment systems and services. As payment services modernized, a sound legal basis is imperative. Although central bank oversight powers are largely drawn from their legal mandates, they may not be the plenary authority over payment systems, payment services, or other financial activities. The legal framework for payment systems and services includes a body of law that determines the rights and obligations of parties in the system, including laws of general application and laws specific to payments. Legal reforms could involve amending existing laws or regulations or introducing explicit law on payment services. Due to the rise of digital payments, the IMF plans to increase its capacity development efforts in this rapidly growing area. Going forward, IMF staff stand ready to assist authorities in the areas of digital payments and financial market infrastructures described earlier. That is to ensure member countries' plumbing systems, the pipes and the payment flows are safe and efficient. My colleague, Dirk Jan, would now provide a more concrete example on an important innovation, electronic money. Thank you tonight. And uh, also for my part, welcome to the spring meetings. There are many uh, types of digital payment service providers. And uh, in this part of the presentation, I will zoom in on uh, electronic money issuers as this is an area in which uh, several member countries have expressed an interest in IMF's technical assistance. I will walk you through the steps uh, Tanai just explained and discuss in more detail step three, the specific risks and how to address these. In particular, I'll explain how tailored prudential regulations and supervision play a key role in making sure that the risks for the users of e-money are limited. So what is e-money actually? E-money uh, can be described as a digital representation of a currency that people can hold in an application or e-wallet on a mobile device. The e-money issuer allows its clients to top up the balance in their e-wallet by a cash payment at an agent or by transferring money from the bank account or credit card. Uh, the resulting balance can then be used for making payments and the e-money issuer has to make sure that that balance that is held in the e-wallet is available in full and on demand. E-money issuers can be banks and non-banks. Banks are of course licensed and have their own regulatory requirements, but what about the non-banks? In many countries, actually the non-banks are leading payment service providers. E-money issuers like uh, Venmo, PayPal, Alipay, WeChat, and Pesa, and Airtel, to name a few, they are well known, and in some jurisdictions, they are actually the dominant provider of retail payment services. Just to illustrate some examples, PayPal provides payment services in virtually all countries across the globe and facilitates transactions in 26 different currencies. PayPal facilitates a transaction volume of about 1 trillion US dollar per year. And at the end of the third quarter of 2020, the total e-wallet balance held by customers amounted to 13 billion US dollar, an amount larger than that of many banks. Alipay is even bigger. It provides payment services in 110 countries, facilitates transactions in 18 different currencies, and claims to have more than 1 billion active users. In the financial year 2019-2020, Alipay realized a payments transaction volume of about 17 trillion US dollars, an incredible amount, accounting for close to 50% of the Chinese retail payments volume. Finally, there are the mobile money providers. This is a subgroup of e-money issuers like M-Pesa, Orange Money, and Airtel Money. They play an important role in providing retail payment services in many sub-Sahara African countries, with transaction sizes sometimes close to 
or above 100% of GDP. Apart from their importance in providing payment services, these payment service providers often are the sole access point to financial services for large parts of the population and play a key role in financial inclusion. Looking at the decision tree discussed by Tanai, clearly e-money issuers are payment service providers that need some form of licensing framework and payments oversight to assure the smooth functioning of the payment system. But what about the additional risks mentioned in step three? What kind of regulations would be needed to address the specific risks of e-money issuers? In a way, you could say that the balances held in the e-wallets are very similar to balances held in a bank account or a bank deposit. Like with banks, effective regulation and supervision is needed to protect clients from losing the balances stored in their e-wallet. However, that does not mean that e-money providers need to be subject to the same prudential regulations as banks. Because e-money issuers are generally not allowed to use client funds to make loans, but actually need to keep these funds safe, the risk profile of e-money issuers is very different than that of banks. Therefore, the prudential regulatory requirements are also different. While there are no international standards in this regard, regulatory frameworks across jurisdictions have important similarities and best practices have been developing. There are three key prudential best practices that I would like to highlight here. First one, uh, fund segregation. This means that uh, received client funds should be legally separated from the assets of the e-money issuer to protect clients from losses in the case the e-money issuer goes bankrupt. The legal segregation assures that other creditors of the e-money issuer have no claim on the isolated assets. Fund safekeeping. This means that the segregated funds can only be held in regulated institutions or invested in assets of a very high quality. For example, many countries require that the segregated client funds need to be deposited in a commercial bank with a good credit rating, or even that they are held in a reserve account at a central bank. Finally, there are specific internal control and operational risk management requirements that I would like to highlight. An e-money issuer should have internal controls to assure that the one-on-one -on -one relationship between the segregated assets and the total balances held in the e-wallets is maintained at all times. The reconciliation is also a key attention point from a supervision perspective. In addition, given the digital nature, cybersecurity and IT risk management requirements are also key to protect the client assets and assure that these remain accessible. Of course, e-money issuers also need to be subject to some form of initial and ongoing capital requirements. However, given their risk profile, these are generally much lower than that of banks. Furthermore, the discussed prudential requirements need to be complemented with more generally applicable requirements on AML CFT, governance, fit and proper requirements to protect the integrity of the financial system, as well as with market conduct requirements to assure that clients are treated fairly. Finally, the regulatory framework needs to be complemented with tailored regulatory reporting and risk-based on and off-site supervision. When we talk about prudential supervision, many people think about the prudential requirements for banks or other credit institutions. But I hope I've been able to explain that prudential requirements are also key in the regulation and supervision of e-money providers. Does this mean that banking supervisory authorities should also supervise e-money providers? Jurisdictions around the world have taken different approaches for the organization of prudential supervision of e-money issuers. For example, 
in the UK, the Financial Conduct Authority is responsible for prudential supervision and market conduct supervision of e-money issuers, while the Bank of England is responsible for payments oversight. In the Netherlands, the Central Bank is responsible for payments oversight and prudential supervision, while the Financial Market Authority is responsible for market conduct. In Kenya, all three mandates are with the Central Bank. The fund is agnostic on the institutional organization. However, it is key that the three different perspectives, payments oversight, prudential supervision, and market conduct supervision are recognized and each receive sufficient attention. Not the least in view of the size and importance that e-money issuers have taken in many of our member countries. Let me close here with summing up the key takeaways. The digital payments landscape is evolving quickly. To analyze these developments, we discussed the conceptual framework consisting of four steps. Identify if something is a payment service. If so, determine whether it requires licensing or designation as a regulated payment system. Third, identify the involved risk and determine how to address these by regulation and supervision. Depending on the type of service, prudential requirements could play an important role. And finally, assure that there's a legal certainty for the developing digital payment services. These steps provide a helpful starting point for authorities to determine whether and how to regulate digital payment service providers. Where needed, the IMF stands ready to provide its member countries support in this important area. Back to you, Anne Margaret. Thank you so much, Dirk Jan, and, and thank you to both of you for this very, very insightful presentation. And now we have some time for questions. And let actually me start with a question for you, Tanai. You talked about inclusive digital payment systems. So my question for you is, does this mean that digital payments will help reduce inequality? Thank you for the question, uh, Anne Margaret. Um, uh, on inclusive payment systems, um, there is a challenge to, to tackle barriers to the adoption and usage of um, transaction accounts. I think that's the key word, transaction accounts, which, is, which sit at the heart of retail payment services. So, um, so um, we did a, we collaborated with the, um, the uh, BIS Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures and the World Bank on a very important work called the Payment Aspects of Financial Inclusion, which, which uh, recently concluded. And, um, and that work was very, very instrumental in, in, in our, you know, in our probe into this very important topic. But the basic, um, you know, finding from that major study was that there were three important elements of trying to promote inclusive uh, payment systems. Uh, first is uh, providing basic accounts, as, as I mentioned earlier, at little or no cost. Uh, second is um, stepping up efforts to increase financial literacy. And third, uh, leveraging large volume payment programs, such as government payments um, by adopting electronic payment services. And on the third point, we, we see that very clear in this uh, recent COVID-19 pandemic that uh, in many uh, countries that uh, have started to um, support, facilitate stimulus payments, you know, to the, you know, the population through electronic means of, of payment. So that is a good sign uh, that, that uh, in, in, in some of the countries that we have been observing on, on, on the point on inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Tanai. And I'm glad you mentioned the importance of literacy. It's, we really see that in many countries that people really need to understand in order to, to, to take on these amazing technologies. We are receiving questions from all over the world. And we have a question that, uh, well, perhaps I'll try with Dirk Jan for this. What kind of Sorry. What kind of special supervisory measures would you recommend to supervisors of payment institutions to face challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic? In particular, the Bahamas launched the SAND dollar recently. And what are your views on this experiment? So, Dirk Jan, would you like to weigh in on that? 
So in particular challenges with the COVID pandemic and payment systems supervision. Yeah, no, uh, of course. Uh, thank you for that for that question. And you know, there, there are different challenges, right? Uh, I think one is more from a public policy perspective where we see that, that governments like Tenai explained uh, are starting to use uh, electronic money and e-wallets also to, to uh, distribute uh, government uh, stimulus. Um, uh, so, so that is one side. Eh? We saw a big increase in, in, in the use of uh, e-money and mobile money. Um, I think from a supervisory perspective, the, the COVID challenges uh, are, are very similar to the supervision of other institutions. It means probably you cannot go on site to supervise the institution. So there will be a stronger emphasis on, on uh, off-site supervision on uh, maybe having integrated platforms so that from a, from a, from the central bank you can directly look into the to, to the systems of the supervised institution so so parallel to the to the increase of e money we also see uh, an increase in what we call uh, a subtech uh, and and regtech like technology used to, to facilitate supervision and, and technology used to facilitate regulatory compliance. Um, so these are, these are some of the, the, the developments that clearly have uh, sped up a lot during the pandemic. On, on the Bahamas, maybe, maybe I can pass that on to, to Tanai as it is more in, his, in scope of his division. Uh, thank you. Gerdjan and Anne Margaret, you know, um, you know, and thank you for the question from from the audience. And um, on Bahamas, um, we have been um, following with a very um, uh, great interest on what's happening in Bahamas. And, you know, I think it's um, it's a very novel innovation what's happening there. Um, and I think uh, our colleagues um, have also made um, you know some analysis on on, on the Bahamas. But if I may, just wanted to draw, um, you know, the audience attention to many of the, you know, the broader work of the IMF on CBDCs that we have been uh, conducting, a lot of interesting work. And and if I just wanted to point that, uh, point you to some of the guiding questions that we, um, you know, we we kind of um, concluded in 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 our work. And um, and those three quite guiding questions were uh, for authorities to um, to ask um, themselves in, you know. When they consider CBDCs, is, is first is what is the criteria with uh, which users evaluate different forms of money? Uh, I think this comes back to um, you know the, the certain attributes you know of the CBDC. How how would that uh, be um, a better alternative to what we currently have? I think that's the first first question on the criteria. Then the second I think comes back to motivation. Um, what um, what are the public policy goals um, of central banks with respect to money? Uh, we are hearing um, the motivations are, are being like financial inclusion, for example, you know, to, uh, we talked about earlier. Um, we also hear um, uh, some issues of trying to use CBDC to address uh, de-risking issues that, 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 were, that stem from corresponding banking relationship withdrawals in some jurisdictions. Uh, we hear motivations on trying to reduce cash for example, so these are some of the questions, you know, that um on on the goals of the CBDC, and and on the third is on the landscape. I think uh, the the question is the big question is, is the competitive landscape, uh, comprising the existing and evolving forms of money in each in, in each jurisdiction. And that is different across countries, and we also IMF staff also found that there was no universal case for CBDC adoption, so far. So. Um, so I, I think uh, for for our audience who uh, who are who may be interested in you know some of the IMF work on this front, I would encourage you to um, uh, uh, check out our work on uh, let's say uh, on topics like casting light on CBDCs, uh, a survey of retail CBDC. We did a recent work on legal aspects of CBDC, cash use and demand of CBDC, and I think designing CBDC. So a lot of work has been done by IMF staff on this front and. I would encourage you to, you know, carefully uh, have a look at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanai. Uh, Dirk Jan, let me now come back to you again. Um, you talked about e-wallets and you said that they're actually quite similar to say bank accounts or bank deposits. But if so, shouldn't also the balance is held 
in e-wallets be covered by deposit insurance, just as is the case for bank accounts and bank deposits? Yeah, that, that is, a, is a question that is actually debated uh, by, by several countries and, and also, I think, uh, by the International Association of Deposit Insurers. Um, and I think the answer is nuanced, right? So it, it depends a lot on the country circumstances and, and uh, uh, the importance of e-money. For example, if I, if I look at Netherlands, where I'm from, uh, people would use an e-wallet next to their bank account. Uh, they would hold a small amount of money in it uh, because th for actually storing their, their, their wealth, their financial assets, they would use mainly the bank, right? And only for operational transactions, an e-wallet. But if we go to, to developing and emerging markets, the situation may be very different. Uh, if we go to, to, to Africa, West Africa, East Africa, uh, e-money may actually be you know, a key for a big part of the poor population to access financial services. And, and also it may be uh, a, a key way for them to store financial assets. So I would say, you know, for, for those countries, uh, there, there can be important considerations to also to, to look into uh, what kind of uh, additional consumer protection or deposit insurance would, uh, would be needed to protect uh, the clients and to ensure that financial uh, inclusion and but also financial stability uh, remains guaranteed. Thank you so much. We're receiving quite a few questions actually from all over the globe and we very much appreciate that and, and there are a lot of questions now in focusing on this aspect both of the COVID but also inclu the inclusive aspect. So for example how can we support access to digital payments by the poor? particularly the most vulnerable people who rely on cash and small transactions for the basic needs. Homeless people, street sellers. And let me add on another that is somewhat related. So have you observed the surge in digital solutions for direct cash, cash transfers in developing countries and in low-income countries during the pandemic in particular? Or is this a primarily phenomenon in more developed economies? So who would like to start here? Dirk, would you start? And yeah, so so maybe let me start. So I I you know I fully agree that that uh, e-money and, and mobile money, uh, which is sub, sub form you know sub element of, of the landscape, uh, are key for financial inclusion. And and I think um, earlier this week I I was sat in a meeting with a country where they explained that during the pandemic, the, the transaction volume increased with 60% uh, in terms of uh, e-money transaction, which, which for one year is, is a huge amount. But I think, you know, the, the, the government also plays a key role in, in stimulating uh, the financial inclusion and the use of e-money and making it accessible. I think many governments, um, in particular in developing countries, implemented policies where they reduced fees on the use of e-money, uh, government stimulus that was being paid out uh, through e-wallets, um, so so that helped to 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 create the financial access and and also uh, you know a reduction in fees might also help people to to start using uh, uh, these type of solutions. Thank you so much. Tanai, did you want to weigh in further on this? Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, uh, Mark, it's a very important qu question on, on inclusion. As, and as I mentioned earlier on, one of the, um, you know, the key, you know, recommendations came in, coming out from the, the so-called PAFI report, Payment Aspects of Financial Inclusion, is leveraging the large volume of payment programs and, you know, coming from government payments. So I think the underlying infrastructure needs to be there too. I think we talk a lot about um, use of uh, mobile payments, um, but but a part of the infrastructure you need like um, QR code standards. Um, you need um, you know robust uh, payment rails. You know that could handle the you know that are scalable. You know that handle the, the increase in large volumes. And the thing is not just a matter of providing a solution, but trying to back to my point of trying to provide an efficient and safe 
uh, make sure that the plumbing system is, is safe and efficient. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have another question, and I'll read it to you, but it's really about how, how can the regulatory framework keep up with all the technological changes that are happening so rapidly. So there's a question, uh, for, exa for example, the growing ad ad adoption of, and the use of cryptocurrencies. Tesla taking payment in Bitcoin, for example. And in summary, how do policymakers frameworks and policies that are agile without stifling innovation, but at the same time protecting the citizens? And to what extent do you involve private sector stakeholders as regulators, that is? So I'll start with you, Tanai. I'm looking at you, so I'll, I'll stop with you this time around. Well, you know, maybe I, I, I would, you know, provide a, a, a broader perspective, if, if I may here, because, you know, the fund has been, you know, given a lot of interest on this topic, you know, since we were involved earlier on in the, in the G7 report on global stable coins, so that came out, and, and we are involved in forums like the, um, in, with the many standard setting bodies, like the Financial Stability Board, um, the CPMI, IOSCO, and, um, and I think this space is really um, still evolving. Uh, and I think uh, I think the um, after the FSB report on regulatory issues and stable coins came out, I think it 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 um, it, um, uh, it gave um, you know the SSBs a lot a lot of um, you know a, a lot of issues to think about. And it's not just one SSB; it's you, you're dealing with um, securities regulators, banking supervisors, um, payment and market infrastructure overseers, and um, the part of the work that uh, I, I have been personally involved is more on, you know, the uh, the financial market uh, infrastructure aspects of it. Like, uh, if so and so, um, stablecoin arrangements evolve into um, sort of, uh, you know, a, of a systemically important infrastructure. What, um, you know, what are some of the issues that we need to, you know, to, you know, to take a careful look at? And it comes down to the public policy objectives. You know, trying to balance that efficiency and safety. And I think, uh, as as just just to answer to that question, I think it's still evolving, and uh, and we are monitoring it very uh, with, with with great interest. Thank you. Maybe Thank you maybe, so I can, maybe I can. Please add, it, yeah. yeah, maybe I can add to the last part. I think what we have seen over the 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 past uh, few years, three four years, is that that supervisory authorities have become extremely active in in. Uh, understanding the innovation that is going on in, in the sector. Of course, it is very difficult, right, for, for a, a regulatory authority to, to be ahead of, of what is happening in the, in the economic sector and to be ahead of innovation. But, um, for example, many countries now have, like, a, an innovation hub or a sandbox where uh, new uh, entrants or, or new ideas can be tested but at the same time, it is an opportunity also for the supervisory authority to learn what are the innovations that are going on, um, would they fit within the regulatory requirements, uh, would the regulatory framework have to be changed. Uh, so I, I think actually that there's a, the, the level of engagement uh, from, from supervisory authorities has increased a lot when it comes to innovation over, over the past few years. Thank you so much. I think we basically covered, if not all, most of the many questions from all over the world. And I think it's becoming time for us to, to wrap up. So again, thank you very much to you both, Jan and Tanai. And I want to say thank you very much to the entire audience that is watching this talk today. We're very pleased to have you join us today. And we hope that this talk really has helped deepen your understanding of the necessary, necessary requirements for the deployment of safe, efficient, and inclusive digital payments. And as we're now concluding the capacity development talks, I also really want to take this opportunity to thank our development partners who are working with us to strengthen institutions and policies all over the world. And please do stay in touch with us on social media via Twitter at IMF CapDev or via Facebook at IMF Capacity Development. So thank you very much. Goodbye, and I hope to see you again soon.